Okay, so we're going to close grateful and thankful today, the series that we've been in all month. And our theme scripture for the series has been out of 1 Thessalonians 5.18, where it says, Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonia, Thessalonica. I'm going to forget the words. He says, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And we've kind of looked at the fact that all circumstances means all the time. It's God's will for us that all the time there is something in our hearts to be grateful and thankful for. And kind of our takeaway theme statement has been uh, being grateful and thankful is a choice not a result. So we don't become grateful and thankful because good things have happened to us. We are grateful and thankful because we choose to find joy uh, in every circumstance and find thanksgiving and gratefulness and gratitude in everything that we go through in life. Uh, so that's kind of been the theme. We're going to close it out. Have you ever had one of those days where you just woke up on the wrong side of the bed? <laughs> today, <laughs> this morning, you know, like life is going along usual. Yesterday was a great day. It's been a fairly, you know, good time of life, but you just wake up and for whatever reason, you, you have a case of the grumpies, you know, and you can't shake it. Not just you woke up in a bad mood and you're like, oh, that's weird. Like when you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, you're there all day and it doesn't matter. Like, well, for me, I can try really hard to get out of that, but it's just for, you know, things, things are generally well, but I'm, I'm grumpy. I'm irritated. I'm frustrated. And I don't have any reason to be that way, but every little thing every little thing is irritating, you know, all the things. Uh, and you're not trying to be that way. Like when you notice what you're doing, you know, you're trying to take deep breaths and you're trying to be nice and you're trying to be kind and you're trying not to like get irritated that somebody left something on the counter and that dirty socks are in the living room again. Like those are small things, but they're annoying today, extra annoying. And you know, Whew. It's like, you know, those sticky hands when you, when you put a quarter in the dispenser and the little plastic things and you got those sticky hands, they don't stick very well, but it's like one of those massive sticky hands just came out and stuck to you and you can't shake it. It's just, oh, the grumpies, they're there. It's real hard to be grateful and thankful on a day like that. No, anybody? It's real hard to, to be grateful and thankful and not feel like you're faking it. Like, they told me to be grateful and thankful, but this sucks, you know? And then you kind of feel like a hypocrite because you're working real hard, but nothing on the inside is matching anything out there. And I mean, believe it or not, I've had plenty of those days myself. We all have. And sometimes, sometimes on those days out of nowhere, I'll get a text from a friend or a family member who has no idea I've got a case of the grumpies today. You know, they have no idea that I'm doing my best and I'm only halfway yelling. You know, I'm not doing all the yelling. I could be doing more, but I'm working on it. Uh, but they'll just randomly be texting me to tell me that I'm on their heart or on their mind, or maybe they're praying for me today. Or sometimes it's something as stupid as like one of those dumb gifs and a, like a funny memory. And it's enough. Like that one thing, that simple touch is enough to, for a moment, just for a brief moment, kind of shake me out of that slump, you know? And it makes me think like, okay, yeah, for whatever reason, life feels kind of hard today, and I'm super grumpy, and I'm irritated, and I'm frustrated, but I'm not, I'm not really alone you know, and I don't need to make such a big deal about all the things that I've kind of fixated on today. Like it's enough for a moment to remind me like, oh, I've got friends. <laughs> I've got family. They care about me. And so this is whatever this is, is weird and I don't love it, but I am grateful. You know, it's enough to like, okay, kind of help me shake out of that. And so it's that idea that I'd kind of like to talk about today as we close out the Grateful and Thankful series, kind of a takeaway statement is it's the expression of gratitude that makes all the difference in our life. It's the expression of gratitude that makes all the difference in our life. So we, as a people, whether we have given our life to Jesus or not, doesn't matter. We are and have been created in the image of God as a people. And we're not meant to do life alone. God is he's one God, three persons. He's a triune God who exists in and of himself in community, in relationship. And he created us in his image for community and for relationship. And he brings transformation to us in and through community and relationship with people. And so knowing how how we can express gratitude and thankfulness to the people around us, I want you guys to hear this, is more powerful and spiritual than we may give it credit for. 
knowing how we can express gratitude and thankfulness to the people around us is more powerful and spiritual than we may give it credit for. Because to show gratitude and thankfulness to a person isn't just to check the box of, okay, I did my nice thing today, because that's what good Christians do. But on a deeper level, and that's what I want us to see today, on a deeper level, if there is understanding behind why we do what we do, then there is power to bring God's healing, his wholeness, and his cleansing to the people around us through our niceties. So not just checking the box of doing the thing that good Christians do, but there is a real and active power behind what we do if we do it with an understanding that the living God is inside of us and he brings transformation and power and healing and cleansing to the people around us. So today I just want to focus on one passage of scripture. We're going to be in Romans chapter 12. And I kind of want to set that up for a minute because Romans was written by um, Paul to the church in Rome. And Paul, he was called to be an apostle by God. And if you don't know Paul's story, it's kind of radical. He was a murderer going around killing Christians. And he's got a radical story of how the Lord knocked him off the donkey, blinded him, uh, sent him away for three days to be blind. Radical story about how, you know, like he heard the audible voice of the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Nobody I know has a story like Paul. It's intense. (laughs) Okay. But it's intense because God had a radical mission for Paul. The radical mission that God gave Paul was, I want you to take everything you know about me. I'm going to teach you more. And I want you to go to people who have never heard about me before. I want you to go to the Gentiles who have no idea about who I am and how I expect people to live and what I have for them. And I want you to tell them about who I am. I want you to show them my glory. I want, I want to do miracles and I want to perform things through you uh, so that people can, so we had a radical mission. So he did that. He went around telling all the Gentiles and hundreds of churches were planted. House churches, large churches, people converted in temples, all kinds of things. Okay, radical story and then radical mission. And he had incredible fruit. Everywhere he went, churches popped up. And so what was happening is after a while, after several years of all these churches, you've got Jewish people, you've got Gentile people, there's Romans, Christians, like they're all coming together and their ways of life were completely different. And so what's happening is all these people groups are getting together and they're trying to live for Jesus, but they got questions, you know, like, can I, like, can, can I be polyamorous? You know, can I have five wives? Is that okay? Um, can I, like, if you go read the book of First Corinthians, it's crazy, the amount of things that Paul was dealing with. And so what happens is in their questions, the guy they know is Paul. Like, you started this thing, you told me about it. Help, <laughs> help me figure this out. And so they write letters to Paul and Paul's like, good, good, good God. <laughs> um, but what he does is he, he hears their heart and then he writes letters back to them and he encourages the things that they're getting right and he corrects the places where their understanding is faulty and then he challenges them. If you've given your life to Jesus, you need to live this way and here's why. And so most of the New Testament is letters back to churches asking questions about how to live life as a community of people saved by grace. And so part of his purpose in writing to the Romans Romans, the Roman church specifically, is that he wanted to teach them how to live in God's righteousness in everyday life. So in everyday life, they wanted to know how God's righteousness plays out in the things that I do. And so Paul wrote to them about that. And what we're going to see in Romans 12 is there are niceties, like these are nice things that good Christians should do, and they're encouraged. But what I want to draw out for us is their purpose. Because they're, they're more than just checking the box. There's a purpose behind the things that are written there. And there's power. I already said this, and I'm going to keep saying it. But there's power to bring God's healing and his wholeness and his cleansing to the people around us through the nice things that we do. So we'll pick up in a... Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. <clears throat> Paul writes, he says, "Don't I love it. Don't just pretend to love others. <laughs> really love them. (laughs) Like easy peasy makes you laugh when you stop and sit with it. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. You know what that means? They were pretending, you know, they were putting on a good show, but carrying around all kinds of hatred and bitterness in their heart. And he was going to deal with it. He says, hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. I mean, Rome, come on. They're the philosophical ones who just sat around asking questions all day, doing nothing. You know, you know the ones? Okay, he says, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Verse 12, rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. 
When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. <laughs> so simple. And then he says, pray that God will bless them. And you say, heck no. <laughs> pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. There was affluent, wealthy people, and there were the poor living on mats. And he says, don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And then he keeps going, and don't think you know it all. Yeah. <laughs> Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. That's an internal question. Am I honorable? Do I do things that honor the Lord in every part of my life? Verse 18, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. <laughs> I wanna, I'm going to go back to that because it's like, yeah, stick it to the man. But I'm going to talk about it later. Uh, and then verse 21, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Okay, that whole section of scripture, when you look at it, is pretty self-explanatory and plenty to think about, plenty to reflect on, plenty to internalize and go, okay, Lord, work in my heart. But I want to break this down. So if you're in the room and you've given your life to Jesus, I just want to remind us of some things. Number one, we are saved by grace through faith, and that faith is a gift of God. We, these are scriptures. We're not our own, but we were bought with a price, and that price was the blood of Jesus. And now we're new creations in Christ Jesus, and we are being formed into his image and his likeness, and he is good. Okay, And now that we have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness and we've been transferred to the kingdom of light, we shine as lights in this dark world. More than that, we are his ambassadors and we have been charged with the weight and the responsibility to partner with him in his work of reconciling people to himself, their creator, the living God. And because of all of that, because of the grace of God and the gift of faith that has brought us into his kingdom, we do don't let evil conquer us anymore, but we conquer evil by doing good. And so those niceties and those things that good Christians do, there is power behind the word. There is power behind why we do what we do, because we are bringing the kingdom of light into the kingdom of darkness. There is power in what we do. There is power in how we act. There is power in what we speak. There is power in how we behave if we understand that we are representatives of God's kingdom. Amen? That's a good word. So how do we do good is the question then. Like, that's great, but I mean, we can just make up what good is, you know? <laughs> you can, and it may or may not be. Uh, but first off, the word says, and I love this, don't just pretend to love people. Don't pretend to love people. We need to really love them. And so how do we really love people? We're just going to look at three things. Number one, we're uh, back to the verse. It says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. So you can write this down. The number one way that we can do good to people is to honor each other or honor people. And I want you to think about it this way, because every person in your family, every person at your job, every person you meet is a person who's been made in the image of God. And he has a good plan for their life. And so the word says, take delight in seeing them as your father does. You take delight in seeing people the way that your father in heaven does. Because if he's your father in heaven, he's their father in heaven, whether or not they're acting like it. He is still their father in heaven, and he still has a good plan for their life. And you get to honor them and bring redemption to their heart and to their soul because of who you are and who he is in you. Uh, and so, in other words, to take delight in seeing people as the father does is uh, another way to say that is it's fun for you to see people the way that God does. <laughs> it's fun for me to see the way people God sees them. When you look around the room and you think, or you look around your family, and, you know, people drive you crazy. <laughs> I got family members, like, just get it together. Um, or, you know, friends, like there's, there's people and you can see the mess in their life. You can see the dysfunction. You can see the heartbreak. You can see the bitterness. You can see the anger. But when you, you take all that and you look back and go, but, you know, 
God loves them. And it is so much fun for me to see how much God loves them. Jesus, would you help me be kind to them today so that my kindness, your kindness through me will lead them to to repentance, would lead them to redemption. Another scripture says that love covers over a multitude of sin. And so Jesus, would you help me to love people with your love today so that your love will cover the multitude, multitude of sin in their life? There is power behind what we do. And so chances are, if you genuinely see people that way, other people, uh, and you remember that they are all children of God, they are created in his image, and he has a good plan, and he has a good purpose for them. If you view people that way, chances are you're going to have honoring things just naturally as a byproduct of your heart. You're going to have honoring and good things to say to them and about them. You will be able to express gratitude to them. And your expression of gratitude to them may make all the difference in their lives about what they believe about themselves or what they believe about the Lord because of who you are and what they know about you. And if you don't, if you don't see people that way, you're like, nope, don't want to, don't, I hate people. They make me so angry. You don't understand. I have this one family member, I have this one coworker, I have this one friend, and it's just, you know, it's in there and I don't see them that way. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, But this is probably an area where the Lord wants to bring some healing to you. And he wants to lead you to a place where you can learn how to express gratitude towards the people around you who are made in his image. Amen? Okay, the next one we can do at verse 11. He says, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Never be lazy, work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. So you can write this down, serve the Lord. (laughs) We can do good by serving the Lord. And what that really means is let the spirit excite you as you serve the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit excite you as you serve the Lord. And I want to kind of just peel back the layers. Because Paul let the Holy Spirit excite him as he served the Lord, we have most of the New Testament. And 2,000 years later, we're still benefiting from Paul's walk with Jesus and all the words he spoke to the followers of Jesus then because he let the Lord excite him and what he did. Now, he did not always wake up on a bed of roses, okay? Let me tell you, his, his life was in sunshine and butterflies and roses. Once he gave his life to Jesus, it actually got incredibly hard. He had a cush life before he met Jesus. When he met Jesus, Read his story in the book of Acts. He was beaten. He was put in prison. He was shipwrecked. He, like, his life got very, very hard. So it wasn't sunshine and roses, but there was joy and there was delight. He served the Lord enthusiastically because he let the Holy Spirit excite him in, in what God was doing. Uh, so just like one story, when Paul was a prisoner... He was held in custody, and he was being shipped with a bunch of other criminals to a different city. They were going, they were on their way to Rome. He hadn't been there yet. On their way, and the, the, the weather is changing, so it's going from fall to winter, and so the storms are getting, the seas are getting really rough, and Paul and the people say, you shouldn't travel now. There was one centurion who had a heart for Paul, and they said, because I want to preserve, preserve Paul's life, you should not travel right now. It's going to be dangerous. It's going to be treacherous. Sure enough, it was. So they're going along, and for two weeks, these, the, the, they were so stressed out, they didn't eat any food. Nobody ate any food on the ship for two weeks, and then finally Paul said, Paul, who's excited to serve the Lord, he's with a bunch of other prisoners, he's being treated as a prisoner, and he goes and he speaks up and he says, because of a dream I had, the Lord told me that none of you are going to be lost, but none of you can leave the ship. And then he says, go ahead and eat something. We're going to be washed ashore. And then right then, uh, they hit a sandbar. The, <laughs> this sounds great. The whole ship sank, you know? And they had to float on pieces of ship all the way to the shore. And then they, they figured out a way off. But it, he actually, so he spoke on behalf of the Lord to the entire ship. And the entire, all the people were saved because of the dream that he had. Because Paul was excited to serve the Lord in all, in all situations, in all circumstances, he let the Lord excite him. The other half of that is like, who's going to be Paul? Really? Nobody in? Okay. But Paul didn't live life alone. This is what happened. Paul surrounded himself all the time. He was intentional about surrounding himself all the time 
with other believers who were leaning into the call of the Holy Spirit on their lives. And they were letting the Holy Spirit excite them as they serve the Lord. He's like Luke, who wrote the, the Gospel of Luke, was one of Paul's traveling companions, and they were both together leaning in. Timothy, you can read the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy was another person that was excited to serve the Lord, and so Paul surrounded Titus. You can read the list of names that Paul always mentions. Those are people that Paul surrounded him with so that he would be encouraged to continue to serve the Lord and in the hard things, through the, through the painful things, he was excited. So Paul didn't do life alone. Another way that we can learn to express gratitude is to let the Holy Spirit excite us as we serve the Lord in our everyday lives. And if you struggle there, the answer could be as simple as being around other people who are this way. Do you know people who are genuinely excited to serve the Lord all the time? Like it doesn't matter what's happening in life. They have joy and they remember the word of the Lord to them and they, they elevate you. You know, when you get around them, you're like, man, I just, I love being around that person because they're encouraging and they remind me of the truth and they remind me of who I am and they remind me of where I'm going and they keep pushing me up the mountain. You got people like that. Like you got to be around them. You have to be intentional about being around those people. Maybe it was your life group. You went through life groups just closed they'll they'll reopen in February but we just went through a whole season of life groups and maybe in one of your groups you met somebody or you saw somebody and you're like now that the life group's over you think man I kind of miss being around that person they were really encouraging they brought joy to me Uh, and so maybe it's hanging out with people from your life group or maybe it's for you it's going through growth track it's time the time is now for you to go through growth track and get on the serve team and start being on the dream team why because you want to meet other people who are living that way way, excited to serve Jesus so you can see them in action and learn from them. If that's you, Growth Track is coming up December 3rd. All three steps are happening. You can find out more about who we are. You can find out more about who you are. You can find out about our serve teams and how you fit so you can start making a difference and being with people who are excited to serve Jesus because we've got relationships in life. I don't think any one of us is so lonely that we don't have even one friend. But the question is, are the friends we have leading us in the direction that we want to go? Are they helping Helping us grow and who God has called us to be. Are they helping us to be lights who shine in this dark world? Or are they slowly snuffing out the light that God has placed inside of us? So let's be intentional about who we spend time around. And then uh, the third scripture I want to bring up again is when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. So you can write that down, practice hospitality. One way that you can do good to each other is to practice hospitality. Now, that doesn't mean when I hear hospitality, I'm like, I'm not hospitable. <laughs> I'm learning because I know people are hospitable. And so I'm watching, I'm like, what do, you, what do you do? Oh, you like put snacks out? Okay, yeah, snacks. Oh, you offer them water? Not garbage water, but real water? Uh, someone came to our house. I love those bubbly water drinks. And I got this one, a spiced apple. And I was like, yes, I love it. So good. Tastes like cider without any of the sugar, you know? People are, are turned off by that. I'm not. Um, so someone came over and I was like, hey. Yeah, I was drinking it. And he was like, I, I offered it to them. And, you know, to. He didn't like it. And then Elliot over here, we're doing, we're great hosts, right? Offers him some kombucha. Elliot brews his own kombucha, okay? And so, you know, so like, you want some homemade kombucha? Uh, So he brings it out. We offer it. We don't give him any water. We don't give him any real drink. We give him two trash drinks. Like, here you go. Now let's talk for an hour, okay? Great hosts. (laughs) So I have to learn from the people around me about how to be hospitable. But that's not what that means. It doesn't mean you have to have a nice, clean, large home and start bringing people over over and be an amazing cook and serving them, you know, 17 course meals. To be hospitable simply means to have the quality or disposition of receiving and treating guests or strangers in a warm, friendly, generous way. It has nothing to do with where you live. It's about who you are. <laughs> be warm, be friendly, be generous, and you will be practicing hospitality. And so to practice hospitality isn't just, you have to put effort into intentionally being warm, friendly, and generous with those you interact with each day. And so a great reflection question is, who am I not hospitable with? (laughs) Like, who sets you on edge immediately as you see them? And how can I practice being, uh, you know, hospitable towards them? So sometimes those hospitable things are as easy as making eye contact and smiling at someone. You know, you're going in the grocery store, they're coming out, you walk out. It's as simple as just smiling and and making eye contact. Like, good morning or good afternoon or 
great weather, uh, or saying nothing, you know, just smiling. Um, it may be taking a few, may, maybe you're out somewhere and you run into a friend of a friend that you met one time and you kind of recognize them or they kind of recognize you and you just take a few extra moments to interact with them. Maybe you remember their name or you remember their face and say, hey, I remember you. Can you remind me your name? You just take a few extra moments with someone you meet in the marketplace or, or out there in the wild, uh, you know, and you're just hospitable and warm and generous uh, to them. Many times the suggestion here is, uh, you know, you might hear, go, you know, go buy the groceries of the person behind you, especially at the holiday seasons. People are stocking up for things. Uh, maybe it's gifts. You're in Target or Walmart and you see someone behind you and they've got gifts. You know, they're buying nifty gifties for the family. And you just offer to buy half of them, part of them, all of them based on your means. That's, that's one great way to be warm and generous. Um, but it could just be as simple as having your eyes and ears open to the needs of the people around you. What are you hearing people say, and is there a way that you can meet that need? Is there a way that you can practice hospitality, that you can be warm and generous towards them? Uh, this, I say have your eyes open because another funny story, I'm in the Dollar Tree like a couple years ago, and I'm, I'm alone. I don't think my kids are with me, and I'm not grumpy. I'm not in a, you ever been to the Dollar Tree? Like sometimes there's one cashier, the line's out the door, and I'm grumpy. I wasn't grumpy. I was in a great mood. I was in the Dollar Tree. I was kid-free, buying whatever I was buying. And I'm probably like three people back. And there's this teenager who's trying to get chips, a soda, and some candy. And for the life of everyone, they can't get the card to run through. He's got one of those Visa gift cards, you know, but once you're like one penny over, they decline the card. And so I think that what was happening, but I wasn't really paying attention. I was just like, man, this line's taking a really long time. It's not moving. Like, poor guy's kind of struggling, you know? But I hadn't, like, there was no thought, like, Tiff. Offer to buy the chips. What is it going to be, like $3? But it didn't even occur to me until the lady, the lady behind him who was irritated, she was so annoyed. She was like, you know what? Let me just get it. So in her irritation, praise Jesus, she covered that little boy's, not little boy, he's a teenage boy, covered that boy's bill, right? And he was like, oh, you know, thank you. And he felt bad because it wasn't going through. And then she softened up. She was so bitter and angry, and then she helped him, and then all of a sudden she felt good and joyful. One kind act, and it'll even turn you over. Anyway, but I was there. I was in the moment. I love Jesus. I'm in a great mood, and I missed the opportunity to be light in the darkness, you know? The grumpy lady got it. But <laughs> the line kept moving, you know? So just have your eyes and ears open in this season and in this time and all of life. Who can I be kind and generous to? How can I be warm and friendly and practice hospitality? So I'm not going to expound on the other ways. I just want to reread verses 14 through 21 because it seems pretty plain, and I believe the Lord is going to speak to us through his word, and he may drop something. So bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. <clears throat> Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. So it's okay to be sad. It's okay to go to the sad person's house and sit with them. Uh, live in harmony with each other. Harmony sounds great. Harmony is music that doesn't hurt your ears, you know? <laughs> Not harmony is like jazz. Turn it off. Oh, just kidding. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. Where the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. And during this, you'll heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. I just really quickly wanted to go back to heap burning coals of shame on their head. Actually, the, it says the Lord our God is a consuming fire. And we know that consuming fire is purifying. Fire is a purifier. And so if we're heaping, if we're heaping coals burning coals on the people said, we're not actually burning them with shame. What we're doing is we're providing a purification process for them. And the more time they, they spend around people who are full of the consuming fire of God and who are doing niceties in the name of Jesus because there is purpose and because there is power, what you're really doing is you're purifying their hearts. What you're really doing is you're cleansing them. What you're really doing is causing them to come to a place of repentance. And so it's not, ah, stick it to the man. It's because I'm kind, because I'm going to love people until they ask why. I'm going to love people until they ask why, and I'm going to lean in. There's going to be repentance, and there's going to be restoration, and there's going to be re redemption in their life because of who Jesus is. He's a purifying fire, and I'm bringing him to you. You know, I'm going to sit with you in that. Okay, so the takeaway is when Paul wrote this letter to the church in Rome, 
Rome was the epicenter of the world. And what Paul longed for was the Jewish and the Gentile believers of Jesus to be obedient Christians for Christ's name. They wanted all of the people in Rome to be alike. And so those niceties that Paul listed that we just read about in Romans 12, they had the power to bring God's healing, his wholeness, and his cleansing to the people around them because of who Jesus is inside of them, who Jesus was inside of them, who Jesus is inside of his people. And so for us, we often want the change to happen somewhere else. We want someone else to lead the way, and we simply just want to follow. We just want things to be better. Maybe we've said something like, it's just little, in me, little old me and little old Lodi, but what would your family look like if you saw them as God saw them and you spoke that goodness over them? What would your workplace look like if you let the Holy Spirit excite you as you serve the Lord and you saw opportunity to bring his goodness and his blessing to your coworkers and the company you work for? And if, what if your family and your workplace started to look that way? What would it do for their families and their workplaces? As you keep on going and you're playing down the line, I do it, and then they're impacted by it, and then they're impacted by it, and then they're impacted by it. How many families and how many workplaces and how many neighborhoods would be impacted just because I decided to turn on the light, just because I decided to express gratitude through the way that I live my life? Um, so I have this fun little illustration. I've got all these candles and you got them all. So the lights are going to come off. So I've got a fire and it's good for me. Jesus is alive inside of me and he's doing things. But I walk around and what I do is I bring light to other people. And as I bring the light to other people, then all the other lights start going on. So if you have the light, you have to work really hard to turn it on. I know it. <laughs> but in a really dark room when all the little lights start shining then what happens is light shines in the darkness and there is hope and it may just be one little spark but when all the sparks light up it really does light the way we're going to keep the lights off in these on for a minute just the other day the power went off in all of Woodbridge and the only thing I had were these guys okay <laughs> I had like five of them and I turned on one and it made a little bit of a difference but I had to like carry it, you know, I had to like shine it right out what I was looking at. I was trying to write something down and I had, to, I had to do this. But I found a few more of them and I lit them up and I put them all over my house. And once I did, once four of them were lit, I could walk into my house and I could see everything. And it wasn't as bright as having the lights all the way up, but it wasn't as dark as just one shining in the darkness. And it wasn't as dark as all the power being out. And so kind of another takeaway statement is doing good brings light to the world. Or Jesus, in this case, it's Jesus, he's, he's light. And so doing good brings light or Jesus to the world. And so last question, what if expressing gratitude through the way we live because of Jesus makes all the difference in the world in driving back those forces of depression, anxiety, and stress in our lives and in the lives of others? Just because we live with light and we bring gratitude, we practice hospitality, we honor each other, and we serve the Lord enthusiastically. What if that's enough to ignite the fire in the person inside of the, the person next to us, the person we work with, that family member that helps push back that depression and that sadness and that loneliness and that anxiety that seeks to take over? Because when you're in the room and they're next to you, there's just enough. There's just enough to give you hope. There's just enough to give you peace. There's just enough to give you some joy to keep on going and to keep on trying. So I want to close with these scriptures out of Romans 15. I pray that God, so as Paul is closing out this letter to the Romans, he says, I pray that God, the source of all hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may God who gives us his peace be with you all. Now all glory to God who is able to make you strong just as my good news says. Let's go ahead and close our eyes and pray this out. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. And we thank you for your power. Lord, I thank you that everything we have comes from you. Father, I was created by you. We were created by you. Your word says that we are held together because of you. All things are held together in Jesus Christ. And then we were ransomed for you. You came and you created the whole pathway, Father, of Jesus coming to the earth and being the sacrificial lamb that would wipe away all of our sins so that we could stand before you. 
because of your great power and because of your great love, it is evident, Jesus, that you don't want anyone to be separate from you. You went through elaborate measures to make sure that every person on planet earth, every person created in your image could come to know you and could live life eternally with you. And I am grateful and I'm thankful for who you are. And so I thank you for your people. Father, I thank you for every heart that is in the room. I thank you for every mind that is in the room. I thank you for every life that is in the room. Jesus, that you are on the move and you are at work. Lord, for all the places in our hearts and in our lives where where we doubt and we struggle and we have anxiety and we're caused to, to maybe not be grateful, to maybe not be thankful. I thank you, Father, that you are there in those places and you are ministering. Even now you are touching us, Lord, and you are bringing to remembrance the goodness of who you are and your power and your strength, that there is a way out, that there is hope, that there is peace, that there is strength to do things your way. And so I thank you for that, Father. With every head bowed and every eye closed, uh, if there's anybody who doesn't know Jesus that way, in that you would be, maybe you've done the nice things and you've done the good things and like I've tried to be a good Christian, but you've done it in your own strength and you haven't recognized the power of the living God at work in your life that puts you at peace. So it's not, you're, you're not earning your salvation, but you're at, at peace and at rest with Jesus and he's alive in you. And so because of that and out of that place, you are able to do good and nice things. If you would say, I struggle there. I struggle in trying to perform for Jesus, but I want to let go of that. And I want to live at peace with who he is, and I want, to, I want to operate in kindness. If that's you, and you would say, man, I want that peace. I want that peace of Jesus in my life. Would you just lift up your hand so I can see you, and I'd love to pray with you. Amen, I see your hand. God is so good. We, go ahead and church, just repeat this after me. Father God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your kindness. I thank you for your son and his generosity and giving his life for me. I repent of my sin for trying to do life in my own strength. I want your way. I want your plan. I want your peace. I want your power. I want your strength to be alive in my life. Come live in my heart and fill me with your spirit and help me to live for you. Amen.